Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the second in our series of podcasts, looking at some of the issues that can arise in relation to wills and the disputes that can happen. My name is Rowan Turrell. I'm the Head of Dispute Resolution at Boys Turner Solicitors, and I'm joined by Ali Toe, who specialises in dealing with contentious probate disputes. Hello, Ali. What are we going to be talking about in this episode? Hi, Rowan. We're going to be talking about the importance of including instructions in your will. Beyond the obvious financial provisions, such as what should happen to your property or any money that you may have in your bank. So, Ali, you're obviously a disputes lawyer. Um, You don't get involved in the actual drafting of wills. So I'm guessing what we're looking at really is some of the areas where problems can arise that you end up dealing with so that hopefully people can try to avoid them. That's absolutely right. And uh, I can just give you a few examples, if that's okay, of um, some of the obvious, more uh, common pitfalls that I see in relation to this. So firstly is the question of your funeral arrangements. It's the duty of whoever is appointed by the testator as executor to deal with the funeral arrangements. Often this will be a close family member or friend, but it could also be a professional person such as a solicitor or an accountant. And they will usually seek assistance from the family as to the testator's wishes, but often they'll have no idea as to your wishes. Uh, Now, some people will say they don't particularly care, but including funeral arrangements in your will can make it a lot easier for your executors when you die and crucially should avoid any family disputes in relation to the same. I guess that's something that none of us really want to think about, but it's a particularly stressful time for those who've been left behind. um, And so it can be useful to, to know what it is that they need to arrange well, that's absolutely right. Um, and it goes further than that. It may, it may also be the case that um, uh, you do, in fact, have some specific requirements. Uh, you may want a particular song played at the start or end of your service. You may have a strong desire to be buried or cremated. You may not want a religious ceremony at all. Um, or perhaps you don't want any flowers and would prefer anyone attending the service to make a donation to a favoured charity. Whatever your thoughts and wishes, all of these can be included in your will. I suppose as well that these are the sorts of things that we generally don't like to talk about in advance either. You're absolutely right. We tend to be quite stiff upper lip about these things. Um, But another example you might want to include as a specific item in your will is the question of personal possessions, uh, such as jewellery or perhaps a favourite painting. Uh, These items may not necessarily be of significant value and often have more sentimental importance. But if you don't make reference to them in your will, you may find your executors overlook them on your death and may even simply throw them away. And I think, Ali, from my experience of the the work that you've done, uh, people won't often realise that many disputes can arise over those sentimental objects uh, and actually, they can be the biggest triggers in terms of family disputes arising in terms of you know who gets that nice vase that was on the mantelpiece. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's often the more uh, what one might view as trivial items, uh, which become the biggest contentious uh, matters um, and, and can really impact on a family dispute after a loved one's death. Um, And moving on from that, a third and an item which is becoming increasingly important is the question of digital assets. Often people don't realise that they have any digital assets, or if they do, they don't appreciate the difficulties that can arise after their death if these are not dealt with in their will. So people may be listening to this thinking, well, I'm not sure if I've got any digital assets. What's she talking about? We'll put it at its simplest. Digital assets are any objects that exist in electronic format only. So this could mean items with no monetary value, such as digital photos and videos or retail loyalty accounts, but could also include assets with a monetary value, such as cryptocurrencies or blockchain tokens. So why is it important that these are actually specifically referenced in a will rather than just being encompassed in a general distribution of assets? Well, it's important to ensure that they're included in your will, because if you don't, it's very likely your executors will have difficulty in gaining access to them following your death. Whilst this can cause enormous administrative issues, it's also just an extra worry for family members at a time when they are also mourning the loss of a loved one. 
So what are the difficulties that can arise if digital assets aren't dealt with? The difficulty is that whilst the law recognises that a digital asset can be classified as property and therefore owned, it doesn't recognise the possibility that a digital asset can be possessed because the concept of possession is currently limited to tangible items such as a house or a vehicle. So whilst a person may own a digital asset, they're not entitled as a matter of law to possession of that asset. So can you give me an example of where this has caused an issue um, by it failing to be addressed in a will? Yes, I can, Rowan. There's actually been a very recent case involving a widow who wanted access to her late husband's online account with Apple following his tragic suicide. She and her late husband had a daughter who was only age 10 when her father died. He'd taken thousands of photos and videos charting the couple's relationship and their daughter's early childhood. And like many families today, had these stored in an online format only. He also had photographs stored of his late father. And following his death, his widow wanted to gain access to his account so that she could retrieve the images and share them with her daughter. She asked Apple for access to his account so she could download the images. But as her husband had not specified what should happen to his account after his death, Apple said no. Sadly, she was forced to issue proceedings against Apple. And although she did eventually secure a court order compelling Apple to allow her to have access to the account, this was not till four years after her husband's death. After the final hearing, she was reported as saying that she had found the entire process very upsetting. And had her husband just included provision in his will, she would have been spared this ordeal. I guess that more and more we're storing our photographs and things like videos online, whether that's on social media or on our phones. Um, and the days of the traditional photo album tucked away somewhere in a drawer may be sort of long gone, sadly. Do you think that the law in relation to digital assets is likely to change in the future to keep pace with that change in our lifestyles? Yes, I think there will be changes. Uh, as you say, the way in which we lead our lives today and we store our photographs and mementos is very different. And the tech companies and cloud providers are already coming under considerable pressure to work with lawyers to make the process less fraught. And in the meantime, government has also tasked the Law Commission with undertaking a review of the law uh, with a view to making rep recommendations for reforms to ensure the law is capable of accommodating digital assets in a way which allows the possibilities of this technology to flourish. Um, however, this isn't going to be a quick process and we're unlikely to see any proposals from the Commission until next year at the earliest. Okay, so that's covered digital assets. As I mentioned at the beginning, Ali, you're looking at areas where disputes can arise. Are there any other particular problem areas that people should consider? Uh, well, there are two other potential important provisions, which I think we should talk about that should be included in your will. And firstly, is the question of whether or not your estate should be held in trust. Holding your estate in trust could have significant tax advantages and may be particularly useful if you die, leaving minor children, as it could mean the children could continue to be housed in the family home until they reach the age of majority. And the question of children gives rise to a second point, and that's the question of guardianship of any minor children. Obviously, we all hope that by the time we die, our children will be adults and maybe even have their own children. But if the worst were to happen, then including a guardianship provision in your will would at least give you peace of mind that someone you trust would be caring for your children. So, Ali, are there other changes in circumstances that can affect what happens to a will that people need to take into account? Yes, Rowan, changes to wills is really important. Um, ironically, a will should always be viewed as a living document. Our personal and financial circumstances may well change throughout our lifetime. And it's always important to remember that any significant changes may well have an impact on the contents of your will. These changes could range from ownership of a different or new property through to more life-changing matters such as marriage, divorce or the birth of children. 
So far as marriage is concerned, whilst you can execute a will in contemplation of a marriage or a civil partnership, such that you would not need to change your will following the ceremony, provided you marry the person specified in your will, that's not the case with the question of divorce. With divorce, although the will itself is not revoked, any legacy to your former partner would be. This means your former partner would be treated as if they had already died, but that part of your estate that was left to them does not automatically revert back to the other beneficiaries. And also with children, it's often the case that a testator's children are born after the execution of the will, and in which case it's unlikely any provision will have been made for them. So it sounds uh, from what you're saying, Ali, as though it can cause real problems if wills aren't kept up to date as various life changes happen. What happens if the will isn't updated? Well, you're right. The consequences of not having updated your will uh, can be quite catastrophic. If the will was validly executed and complied with the requirements of the Wills Act, then this could mean your estate would be distributed in a manner which you did not intend and may well mean that family members you did not want to inherit your estate do so, and those that you did want to inherit don't. Um, I should just add that this would be subject to any potential claim any applicants may have under the Inheritance Act. And that's something we're going to be looking at in more detail in our next podcast, along with other ways in which a will can be challenged. I was going to say, Ali, I think that leads very nicely into our next discussion. Um, So next time round, that's what we're going to be discussing. What happens when a will doesn't necessarily make provision for somebody that believes that they should be provided for under a will? Um, Thank you for today's explanation, Ali. um, And I look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks, Rowan. Goodbye. And thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. We look forward to you joining us for our next discussion. And you can find more details on our website, boysturner.com. Bye.